well to those joining us online. I'm Gloria Palmer, the Executive Director of Green Mountain Academy for Lifelong Learning. I'm very excited for today's program, but before I introduce our guest speaker, I have a few announcements. First of all, please silence your cell phones. And then on Tuesday, it's March 19th, we too. have Tim Duplo from the Audubon, Vermont. His talk is titled Vermont Forest Birds oh, on Mission 101. So this presentation will, will be focused on Vermont's forest birds and the basic concepts that any land, uh, landowner can apply on their property to become more familiar with the bird community and big and small ways to help our feathered friends out as stewards of their own spaces. And then on Saturday, March 30th, Tim Dupo will lead us through um, a field walk and owl prowl at Burke Forest and Farmland Center. And that is uh, from 5.30 to 7. Um, that's a good time to possibly see the owls at that time. So there is limited enrollment in that particular program. Actually, I think we have one spot left. Um, so if you're interested, please sign up for that. Um, both of those programs are in collaboration with the Audubon Vermont and Burke Forest and Farmland Center. During Q&A, we will have a mic um, that will be passed, and so if you have a question, please raise your hand and wait for the microphone to come to you. And for those online, you can type your um, questions in the chat feature, and Liz will monitor that. I'd like to thank the Manchester Community Library for welcoming us here in this space, and thank you to GNAP TV for videotaping this program and running the live stream feature. And thank you to Merck Forest and Farmland Center for partnering with us on this program. Our guest speaker is a historian, museum administrator, and consultant, and the author of Hands on the Land, A History of the Vermont Landscape. Jan grew up on a dairy farm in Minnesota and has a BA from Carleton College and a PhD in British and American History from Yale. She lives in Weybridge with her husband, Middlebury College professor, and GMALT presenter, Paul Morrow. She currently serves as president of the board of the Vermont Historical Society. Please join me in welcoming Jan Albers. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Shouldn't you people be home lambing? Do we know what time of year this is? Anyway, um, so Manchester is Vermont's high-end shopping mecca. And amidst the luxury goods, it does not take much effort to find some items made from merino wool. From bat hats to jackets to sweaters to darn tough socks, um, but I, there you go. Um, you can outfit yourself head to toe in merino, and it's generally regarded as the highest, you know, on, on the scale of, of wools, it's the highest. It's cashmere, is it really wool? Um, this is the number one. And, uh, and it has incredible special properties. It is moisture wicking, it has the actual Wool itself has a natural crimp in it, so that it's insulating. It um, it is it keeps the wearer dry, and people it's so soft that people, including me, who can't wear other kinds of wool next to their skin, can wear merino. It's very very special, and uh, you'd think this wonder wool is a new development coming to us over the last two centuries of breeding, but it has been, it has had these incredible properties since the late Middle Ages. High up in the hills, above Madrid, the monarchs of Spain used to go to cool off in the summer to their palace and monastery at El Escorial. And on the, on the sides of these hills, they raised the most amazing sheep in the world, the Merinos. They were a Spanish breed, and they were regarded as so special that they would not sell them to anyone. They just hoarded them all. It was their very own royal sheep. And, um, and uh, in fact, they were regarded as so special, the sign of an early modern animal that
that is really something is when it gets painted. And uh, the, mer the merino, this is the very first picture of a painting of a merino. And it's called El Buen Pastor, the Good Shepherd. And, you know, the Good Shepherd parable, the shepherd is Jesus, and the, and the lamb is, is his special lamb. And uh, this lamb that was special enough to be there was a merino. So that is how they looked in the 17th century. This Spanish royal exclusivity was all to change thanks to Napoleon. What's Napoleon doing in this story? He always seems to get into every European story, doesn't he? Um, King Ferdinand VII of Spain had hardly come to the throne when he was overthrown by Napoleon. And this is a painting showing Napoleon, as you recognize him, with the, always with the hat, um, taking the control of Madrid in 1808. And uh, Napoleon's armies knew a good thing when they saw it, and they had their eyes on the Marinos, among many other things. So the Spanish elite panicked, and uh, they had always had a blockade, but they they lifted their blockade to some of their best friends and decided that they needed money to fight Napoleon. They were going to have to sell some Marinos off. And therefore, they, um, they started looking around for people they trusted because they didn't want them to become French Marinos. <laughs> so Ferdinand's loss was Vermont's gain. In 1810, a man from a Boston Brahmin family named William Jarvis, who President Jefferson had made U.S. consul in Lisbon, got a license from the Spanish government to export 3,638 merinos. He sold some to people up and down the eastern seaboard, from Virginia to New England, and he presented some to some of his special friends. Um, including some, a small number of breeding stock to Thomas Jefferson. So Thomas Jefferson had had a merino before, but it hadn't worked out very well. But um, he, was, um, he was very much looking to get into merinos if he could get his hands on some. And uh, so they scratched each other's backs, and Jefferson got his breeding merinos. And um, uh, there's a very interesting uh, letter from William Jarvis to Thomas Jefferson in which he says, Sir, my veneration for you being in no wise lessened by your secession from office, I hope you will allow me again to trespass on your goodness with a small present, which I trust from your patriotism will not be unacceptable. After much exertion, I have been able to obtain a few merino sheep warranted of the best breed, as the best breed in Spain, and thinking the climate of Virginia more favorable to their propagation as more resembling that of Spain than the northern states. He was going to change his mind on that one. But anyway, um, than the northern states. I cannot forbear, sir, making you an offer of a ram and you, both of the mark of my great esteem and well knowing that the experiment cannot be in better hands. Um, and I pray you, sir, to do me the favor of their acceptance. Least, sir, the idea of expense should, less, sir, the idea of expense should deter you. Allow me to say that, that they did not cost me very much, uh, having got them at a reasonable price with the assistance of a Spanish gentleman. So um, that was in 1810. Uh, and uh, he got a reply a few months later from Jefferson who said, I must acknowledge your last favors in putting me on the list of those who were able to extend the improvement of one of the most valuable races of our domestic animals. The, marine, the four mariners are now safe with me here at Monticello, and good preparations made for their increase the ensuing season. 
Pursuing the spirit of the liberal donor, I consider them as deposited with me for the general good and, devising myself of, and divesting myself of all gain, I propose to devote them to the diffusion of the race through our states. As fast as their increase shall permit, I shall send a pair to every county in the state in rotation until the whole are possessed of them. Later visitors to Jefferson recording his, recorded his wearing clothes made of homespun from those merinos. And uh, merinos, as it turned out, are not forgotten at Monticello. When I was researching this paper, um, I went on the Monticello site and in the shop at the, at the estate, they're selling merino clothes. They have men's sweaters and, you know, I doubt they're from the original, I don't think they're making them there or anything or from the original ones, but it's kind of nice to think that they remember that there's a connection between merinos and Monticello. Vermont's time for merinos came in 1811 when Jarvis returned from Europe with a flock of 400 hand-picked Merinos, he kept the best for us, um, which were shipped to his new farm in Wethersfield along the Connecticut River. And, um, you know, he had grown up in Boston, but he loved agriculture, he loved farming, he loved Vermont, and thought it was the most wonderful place and couldn't wait to become a gentleman farmer in Vermont, which he soon did. He would breed Merinos there for the rest of his 48 years on earth, uh, traveling all around the country promoting the breed. He promoted it in Vermont to great success, but he also promoted it all over the country. He sold some back to Europe. Um, he was the greatest pusher of merinos you could ever have. And, um, and he promoted in the process one of the greatest agricultural stories of the 19th century. So what kind of a world were these well-traveled Spanish merinos coming into? In the first decades of the 19th century, Vermont was not very similar to Monticello. Much of Vermont was still largely a frontier. I mean, we were getting by, you know, 1810, there were, there were towns in Vermont, but, um, you know, they were pretty, they looked more like Dodge City than, you know, Manchester looks today, for instance, but um, they, um, there was still a lot of frontier in Vermont. This very famous, very idealized painting by Thomas Cole, it's quite a controversial painting at this point, but it, um, it shows what the more remote parts of Vermont still looked like. People were still in log cabins in the Northeast Kingdom, up in the mountains, um, whereas in the river valleys, in the Connecticut Valley and in the Champlain Valley in the far south, where people were coming up from the south, things were getting more developed. But it was still, um, it was still a pretty uh, rugged and frontier world in much of the state. And, um, and the overwhelming majority of Vermont's residents were agricultural workers and farmers. Um, Farms have traditionally been seen as falling into two camps. There are diversified or subsistence farms and specialized farms. And at this point, almost every farm in Vermont was a subsistence or diversified farm. And, um, you know, they had already, people, you know, in the world of agricultural, you know, or the kind of proto-economists of the agriculture world were thinking um, you know, talking about which was better. Was it better to have a little bit of everything your family needed, or was it better to focus on one thing and try to get money? On a diversified farm, the family raised a little bit of everything, meeting as own, many of their own needs as possible. And on a specialized farm, the farmer grew mainly one thing. And um, in early Vermont, that was a little tricky because there was very little cash. There was very little money in the state. So even if you could make a profit, there wasn't a lot of money for people to pay you. Um, so most of the early farmers were diversifiers. And, um, and uh, so the, most of the farmers were selling, I mean, they were growing 
what was called Indian corn and squash and beans as, as the Abenaki had done as well. They had a, flo a little flock of sheep. They had a few other vegetables and um, they had a cow or two. They had, if they were lucky, they had a yoke of oxen and they had pigs, pigs, you know, pork was the favorite meat of Vermont for at least 100 years. So they often had a fair size um, group of pigs and, um, and they were just starting to put in fruit orchards in the Connecticut River Valley. That started in the 1790s and was going very quickly because they were hoping to be able to make hard cider. Sadly, by the temperance movement, when it came in in the 1830s and 40s, a lot of those apple trees got chopped down. And uh, they're back now, but it's uh, at least in the Champlain Valley, I know they are. Um, uh, but uh, they didn't last long the first time around. But, you know, some farmers were getting frustrated. They felt like, you know, I'm doing okay. My family is eating. We have a, well, we have a better house than the log cabin. We're coming along, but we're not getting ahead. Um, and we've got, you know, eight kids. They all want a piece of this. And how do we, how is anybody going to make it, you know, if we start dividing this up? And uh, so there was getting to be kind of a wish for something more to do. And, uh, and who should come along but William Jarvis and his marinos? Um, so in, uh, when he started selling them and propagating them and selling them around the state, there was a huge pent-up demand for some kind of a capitalist sort of agriculture. And um, he was the man for the job. He was generous with the flock. He, uh, he enjoyed a profit, but he was also happy just to be civic-minded. And he always sounded like a lovely person. He was very civic-minded and caring about the state. And um, by 1811 and 1812, about 20,000 marinos had poured into New England. So they came very, very quickly. It was a floodgate that was opened. And uh, the first marinos really didn't impress people. Marinos, when they're you know, full of fleece, look big. But they're actually really tiny after you shear them. They're not big. They're not good meat. They're not good to eat. They're kind of bony old, old uh, lamb chops. Um, but, uh, and then they had these big wrinkles in their frames. And the wrinkles were tricky and hard to cut. They had a huge amount of lanolin in their, in their fur so that they were in their fleece. So they attracted a lot of dirt because um, it would stick, you know, any dirt would stick to them, dirt and twigs and um, and so here's a flock of these dirty little merinos. You can see that these are white sheep, but they don't look very white. So the first people who saw them thought, no, nah, I don't think so. Um, looking back on seeing his first merino, William R. Sanford reminisced in 1865, I can well remember the first merino ram brought into my neighborhood. He was small and had short wool, which was very dark and crusty on its outer ends. So strong was the prejudice against him that one person gave notice to his owner that if he got into the lot with his native sheep, he would shoot him. But after a few experiments, the tide turned strongly in favor of those merinos. So, uh, so these, uh, the good thing about the lanolin in their fleece was it made them heavier. So when you sheared the sheep and weighed it, it was really a very, very heavy fleece. Um, and, uh, and that upped your profit because they were always selling them straight off the sheep. They didn't let them wash them out. <laughs> and, uh, and this could lead to unscrupulous sellers um, who were trying to pass off inferior non-merino rams as merino breeding stock by concocting a mixture of linseed oil, burnt umber, and lamp black that closely made them look like this. And it looked and smelled and felt like real merino yolk, as it was called. 
This was called the Cornwall finish. Now that was not an aspersion on the people of Cornwall. They weren't the ones doing this. They were trying to make them look as good as a merino from Cornwall. Um, and so they would, uh, these were often, when they started exporting them out of state toward the West, um, this is often the trick they would play and they'd sell them to people in Western New York. And then by the time they washed them, the guys were all halfway back to Vermont, never to be seen again. So, so that was another way of making a living on merinos, but not a very honest one. So the breed took off with lightning speed. Everyone with a place for pasture wanted merinos. By the 1820s, merino sheep had almost totally supplanted native breeds in Vermont. Vermonters believed their state was particularly suited to merinos, and the Champlain Valley was proving to be perfect merino country. It was said that on every hillside, the flocks were grazing. Americans had fought for their own independence, and now they wanted a sheep industry that would be independent of England and the rest of Europe, and that's what they hoped to have from the merinos. Um, the rate of expansion was astounding. I mean, people whose fathers and grandfathers had cut the virgin forests to clear land for hard, hard scrabble lives as subsistence farmers were now finding that there were big profits to be made by specializing in one thing. Breeding merinos um, were, were people like the Wilcoxes of Orwell, the Jewetts of Weybridge, uh, and they were making a killing, breeding merinos with fleeces heavier than ever before. Sheep take a lot of grazing land, and the big operators were expanding their fields, rapidly buying out the smaller, more marginal farmers around them. Uh, many of whom gave up and just headed out west. Concerned about this trend, a Vermont Chronicle story in Windsor was exhorting his readers in 1834, beware of the western fever, and above all, sell not your land to your rich neighbors for sheep pastures. There was reason to worry, as some of these... Uh, consolidations led to blights on the landscape. When the smaller farmers sold out and moved west, it paid the ne'er-do-well to buy up the smaller places, use the barns for sheepfolds, and let the houses just fall into the cellars. As sheep raising took up more and more space, other animals were also being squeezed out. Uh, in the 1830s, the numbers of cows in Vermont decreased by 13,000, two-year-old stock by 15,000, and yokes of oxen were down by 15,000. This is, uh, in this picture, we see what, what it did to the landscape of Vermont to be clearing all this land for sheep. Um, I don't know how many of you watch All Creatures Great and Small. Have any of you seen Show of Hands? How many people have seen that show? That's in the Yorkshire Dales, and they look a lot like those hills in the background. They're about, the Yorkshire Dales are about 2,500 square feet. Ours are a little bit higher. But uh, anyway, this is Ludlow in 1859, and by then that process was pretty well done. And I'll, a lot of sheep uh, had gone to the mill uh, for wool. I mean, a lot of wool had come out of those, those hillsides. Um, this gives you some idea. I'll leave this up for a bit. This is Vermont sheep populations from a survey of 1837. Every county had sheep. You can see how many. And after the county, it shows the town that had the most sheep in that county. So like Bennington had 69,828, and Shaftesbury had 12,000 of those. And you can go right down the list. I think Rutland County had the most. Windsor and Addison came next. But um, Shoreham and Addison County had more sheep than any other county in the world. 26,584. There was nowhere else that had that many sheep. I think it was 11 sheep to each person in, uh, in Shoreham. 
So uh, they were really getting around. And as you can see, it was worth a huge amount of money. There are a million, over a million sheep producing 3.571 pounds of wool. And the profit at 50.5 cents a pound was 1,803,751. I mean, that's staggering in a county that had almost no money before. Um, and this is just in you know, 20 years. It's kind of amazing. And, uh, and uh, throughout the Champa Champlain and Connecticut Valleys, these sheep riches were showing up everywhere. Large fields, new white clabbered farmhouses, a proliferation of fancy carriages on the roads. It was difficult for traditional subsistence farmers to compete in the shadow of a sheep czar's rising mansion. There was a pattern to the merinos year. Lambing time was right around now in March. Um, days and nights were spent, uh, spent in the sheds, the winter sheds, um, while May was shearing time. Accounts of sheep shearing are something like we think of as haying. I don't know how many of you are familiar with hay, but they were sort of a, a communal neighborhood thing where um, the Quaker Robinsons at Rokeby and Ferrisburg got, a, uh, got merinos early on, and they wrote about, Rollin Robin, 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 Robinson wrote about how the neighbors would come over and uh, he said um, when they had shearing, it was so much fun. People worked together with jesting and the cellar, telling them merry tales from morning till night and bursts of laughter everywhere. The farmers, who were the most expert shearers, using shears like this, this is what they use on those thick, thick fleeces, could do 25 to 35 sheep a day. It's just hard to even imagine doing that. I mean, I bet your arms were pretty sore. Um, and, um, and it was really tricky to try to do it because of those folds. You know, they have those folds around their, up by their necks, especially, but all over on the arena, which greatly increases the surface area. So, you know, it's kind of like, you know, open it out a map. Once it's done, it's a lot bigger than your, your merino looks. Um, but, um, but it was um, a huge job to get into those folds, and you have to be a real expert to know how to do it. I love this guy because his name is Wrinkly. You know, and he says it all, really. Um, he lived uh, at the Hooker Farm in Cornwall. And um, one, one, later, one observer said, once you took it off that, that fleece, you could open it like a book. It was so, you know, so thick. It went down so deep. Um, then once they got the fleece off, the fleece were carefully tied into bundles for shipping to markets and mills. While the men were wrestling the merinos, the women and the girls were indoor cooking up great big huge meals, just like they used to do for hay balers from the neighborhood. And uh, so that made a whole party at the end of the day with everybody having a great big dinner together and joshing with their neighbors. And a lot of these fleeces were bundled off to the new woolen mills, because of course the, the wool, the wool, the sheep industry was leading to a bigger wool industry. And um, they would go, a lot of them from southern Vermont went out through Larrabee's Point on Lake Champlain in Shoreham, and, um, and were shipped south, they were shipped west, um, and, uh, and uh, but even in Vermont, a lot more a lot more mills were being built. This is the old stone mill in Frog Hollow in Middlebury. And um, it had been an earlier cotton mill, and then the cotton mill burned down. So it was rebuilt in 1840 as a woolen mill. So it's kind of interesting. You'd think it would be going from wool to cotton, but it actually went from cotton to wool. And, uh, and uh, I can tell you, there are a lot of women working in these mills, too, which is kind of interesting. 
But I can tell you a story about one enterprising young woman. Helen Brittell grew up in a brick house in Weybridge, built by her, fa her father, a clothier named Orange Brittell. And he had a woolen mill on a small Otter Creek waterfall in their backyard. Helen lost her mother very early when she, and she was tasked with taking care of her younger sister and brother and doing a lot of sewing and cooking in the house. Um, but in her memoir, she told of, that her father also taught her how to run all the machines in the mill if they ever had a speed up or an emergency. So when she was still tiny, he built a little wooden box for her to stand on in case he needed an extra pair of hands. But she wasn't working in there every day. But this knowledge came in very handy for this bright young girl one day, as she later, later wrote in her memoir. I remember how one beautiful morning when father went to Virgin's for dye stuffs and oil for the factory. He gave my sister and me the day to go visit a friend in the country, and we were going over to visit Louisa Jewett, who lived a couple miles down the road, and her, her dad was one of the biggest merino guys in, in Vermont. Um, her father, Sol Solomon Jewett, was a rich farmer who made a specialty of merino sheep, and several of the sheep's portraits hung life-size in the parlor. About the time we were ready to go there, there came from Cornwall, the next town, a man with 60 pounds of wool to be carded for his wife to spin. He was much disappointed to find father gone and said if he could just have a few pounds of rolls, he'd come back another day for the rest. I felt confident that I could card a few pounds, so he waited until I carded six pounds. And he went home well pleased. Of course, our visit was spoiled, but I had secured a 60-pound job, and what I, so what did I care? This is the kind of machine this little girl would have been running. It was water-powered. I think this is the one from Sturbridge Village, maybe. But this is, you know, would you want your 11-year-old you know, girl standing on a box um, working on this? But, you know, all hands on deck in this, per in this period. I live in Helen Bertel's house now, and when I hear the water going over the dam out back, I think of her standing on a box in that factory, carding wool, and of the other girls who were part of the merino boom. A naive agricultural community did not fully anticipate the pitfalls of specialization. In 1840, it seemed like the sheep miracle could never end. And by 1850, the merino craze was almost over. How could this boom go to bust in one decade? The burgeoning woolen mills were demanding cheaper wool to make cheaper clothing for the mass market. You know, they were kind of being killed by their own success. Um, they were successful in their efforts so that the relaxing, they, I mean, they turned to the government to take off the tariffs. And they were successful so that the government started reducing tariffs on importing wool. And, uh, and then they took it off completely in the 1840s. So it was flooded with uh, cheaper wool from the opening west. Now, in this period, the opening west wasn't Kansas. It was Ohio and Michigan. They were getting about as far as Michigan the 1840s, and uh, they were very interested in sheep too, but they just had easier terrain for, for growing these animals. And the opening of the Erie Canal, the coming of the railroads, which was way, raising all these hopes in Vermont that they were gonna be able to go to Western markets now, it turned out the trains ran all in the opposite direction, bringing in cheaper stuff from the West instead of furnishing markets for our more expensive merino wool. So what do you do when it's costing you more to feed your sheep than you can make for their fleeces? Beneath all that wool, merinos don't have much to eat. And so up to two-thirds of the state's merino sheep 
were killed between 1846 and 1850 because they just couldn't afford to feed them. Vermont farmers now saw that there were dangers in putting all your eggs or fleeces into one basket. Farmers were forced to turn their backs on, uh, and uh, revert to older subsistence measures to survive on their land. In the next decade, many sold up and uh, took those trains um, to, the, to the west, where to New York State, Ohio, Michigan, and Illinois. But Vermont's reputation for breeding the greatest merinos didn't die so quickly. Whereas mass raiding of merinos was quickly dying out, um, becoming the greatest merino breeders in the world was still an option for the lucky and wealthy few, particularly in Addison County. The Civil War brought a little revival of woolen clothes because all those Union Army guys needed uniforms, they needed blankets. So that stimulated it for a while. And as cotton from the South was no longer available, um, this was also a big help to the woolen industry temporarily. So um, great mansions were still going up. And, um, and the big operators were starting to specialize in only breeding merinos and selling breeding stock. Colonel Edwin Stowell came, you know, he left his estate to go to the war and became a very distinguished soldier. And then when he got back, he was, he built his big house, Stonehenge. I don't know why, why Stonehenge? Though there are a lot of sheep grazing around Stonehenge, if you've ever been there, the real one. But, um, and this is a beautiful picture of his, of his merino stock. He became very, very, very wealthy and very famous. One of the most impressive houses to come out of the merino breeding world was the Wilcox Cuts House. That's on 22A in Orwell. It became her historic Brookside Farm. It was a bed and breakfast for a while, but I'm not sure if it is now or not. But the Wilcoxes were the greatest, one of the greatest merino sheep breeder families. And then when they died out or sold off the cuts, um, were the greatest Morgan horse breeders, and one of the greatest of those in, in the world. So, um, so, you know, while some farms were going under, many people were leaving, the rich were getting richer, the poor were getting poorer. And, um, and, and, and in this period, it's breeding stock, um, could sell for unbelievable amounts. You still can't believe it. Alonzo Bingham of Cornwall sold $43,402 worth of breeding merinos in one eight-month period in 1850 um, to farmers as far away as Virginia and Michigan. A great merino ram could command a stud fee of $3,000 and sell outright for $10,000 or more. Later in the century, Addison County merinos were being sold to customers as far away as Australia and New Zealand. I mean, Vermont guys from, you know, Addison County would go to Australia with sheep and sell them for these phenomenal prices. And why are my darn tough socks coming from Australia merino sometimes? They are, you know, they're still exporting a massive amount of, of merino from there coming from Vermont, original Vermont stock. Um, Edwin Hammond of Middlebury established what was probably the most famous merino flock in history by successfully working to breed what he called the, um, the, American, Ver the American Vermont <laughs> merino. And this merino was supposed to be, you know, the, the champion merino. These were the champion merino line of all time. Uh, they had a he very heavy fleece. By 1865, his ram sweepstakes, this is the 
gentleman himself, um, was regarded as the quintessential merino with a fleece that weighed up to 30 pounds. I mean, we thought it was big when they went to two pounds to five pounds. This guy could have a fleece of 30 pounds. Rams were selling for huge prices, up to $3,500. Stud fees could be almost that high. Simeon Rockwell made $20,000 in stud fee for a champion ram over four years in the mid-1860s. Some of his rams were like celebrities, um, known to all. Everybody knew the names of these big merino uh, breeding rams. The Middlebury Register carried what amounted to an obituary. But, uh, when Edwin Hammond's ram, Gold Drop, died in August, 1865. It read, Mr. Hammond's best ram gold drop died. It was valued at $25,000. This sheep probably had a reputation better than any other sheep that ever lived. He will be sincerely mourned by all sheep breeders at home and abroad. It's really sad. But um, and, uh, this is a real one. Like that was a, you, know, you get these, these um, pictures of, of these that look like you know, they're the size of a barn or so. You know? And then this is a U. This is a, the a pure American Vermont Merino stud U. So this is what these uh, also filthy looking girls look like. Um, they, were, uh, they were quite amazing with their, their folds and their, their yoke, as they called it. A farmer about to make an investment in an animal that expensive wanted to see what he was getting. This being the high end of the trade, the advertisement could not just be accurate, they were expected to be aesthetically pleasing. And if you bought that Ram, you wanted a picture of it in your parlor. Luckily, the county also spawned creativity, and a native son of Addison County, Luther Webster, became known as one of America's greatest ever living livestock artists. Webster, 1858 to 1944, was born too late for the big sheep boom, but he grew up in Shoreham around the thriving Merino breeding stock area. And he and his brother Frank were both very artistic. Um, and they found their niche capturing these noble frames and giant rolls of fleece of the Merinos in three mediums. They did etchings, crayons, and pen and inks. Frank died young, but many of his meticulous drawings survive at the Sheldon Museum. Luther thrived following the agricultural fairs around the country in the summer, fulfilling commissions. And I don't know if you can see, but all their names, these are used, and all their names are on here. There's Dinah, number 130, Echo, Beldam, Daisy, and Columbia. Very noble, right here on the shore of Lake Champlain. Luther's eye for a good merino was not only artistic, he was enough of a specialist in the breed to be able to judge sheep at the famed Chicago International Show. He also enjoyed another career in livestock journalism, serving as field editor of the American Sheep Breeder and contributing to the Shepherd's Criterion. He knew how to spot a prize sheep like few men of his age, because he had drawn so many of them. Prize pedigree merinos had spread all over the world. Sales that would soon put the Vermont industry completely out of business. By, the, by World War I, there were almost no merinos left in the state of Vermont. Most of the sheep industry was being replaced by dairying as Vermont farmers could send oceans of milk in refrigerated trains now to the industrial cities all up and down the East Coast. And, uh, but many of the farmers who made this transition really missed sheep farming. 
Nobody turns into a dairyman who could sheep farm. It's so relaxing. You know, you have the big, the big um, you know, birthing time and the big shearing time, and a lot of the rest of the time, you know, the sheep's the sheep do pretty well on their own, but dairying, you're up, you know, you're milking at least twice a day, you're haying, you know, it's a massive change to the system to be dairying. I grew up on a dairy farm. I love those cows, but I know how much work it was. So, um, the merino sheep boom and its bust taught Vermonters some happy lessons and some hard ones as they went from a subsistence economy to specialization. And subsistence had made it possible for farms of all sizes to provide a living for families um, by letting them do for themselves. But it didn't bring in much money. The specialization brought in huge amounts of money and created the smooth hillsides you can even see there's some of that in, in that, that picture. Um, but, um, but it also um, led to the horrible bust and a lot of families suffering. Um, and, uh, but, you know, we grew up in a nation of tree lovers. Now everybody is so happy, you know. Vermont went from 75 to 80% deforested in the sheep, uh, you, know, you know, the late 19th century to 75 to 80% forested again as we are today. So, and we know the ec ecological benefits of, of trees, but um, people who grew up in the deforested Vermont of the sheep era missed its openness and its huge vistas and, uh, and really mourned it when it was gone. As one Vermont woman, Ruth Dutton, looked back from the 1930s to her childhood in the sheep era, where everything was looking like this. She said, I grew up on a farm, and someday I hope farms will come back. I'm looking for the day. Oh, it makes me sick. All the hills were open country, and a great many people had large flocks of sheep, and those Pastures were grazed, so they were just like lawns. There was no brush scattered around. Well, all those hills are grown up now. No one who isn't very old can remember how they looked. The cattle and the sheep were turned out in the spring and got in in the fall and kept in barns through the winter. You went up once a week to salt them, and they were all right. They were happy. But now it's all just growing up to wilderness. It was agriculture more than all other changes put together that altered the look of the Vermont landscape in the 19th century. It was farmers who chopped down trees, cleared out brush, built houses and barns, planted the crops, created the meadows, and scattered them with sheep and horses and cows a landscape that had once been overwhelmingly green and dark, dense with trees, was then opened and swathed with the colors of the crops, light greens and dark, golden wheat, blue flax, and red clover. Every color represented a choice that somebody made about what to do with the landscape. The green valley pastures were planted with rows of corn and trees began to grow back up on the hillsides. The rich farmland of the valleys lay as multicolored tables below the dark regreening of the green mountains. It's lambing time now and you can still stand outside on a cool spring night in Vermont listening for the ghostly bleeding of the lambs. I'm not getting my lamb. <laughs> Isn't that cute? <laughs> anyway, that's our talk. Um, does anybody have any questions? Thank you. Thank you. Any questions, anybody?
I guess I said it all. Yeah. I'm just kidding. More expensive. Oh, Why were the merinos more expensive to raise than the other breeds of sheep that put the merinos out of business? Well, a lot of the, the merinos that put them out of business, they were just more, became more expensive to raise here. A lot of the, what put them out of business were merinos that could be raised more cheaply in Ohio, where it was great big flat, open fields, and, um, and where they had good transportation links, you know, that took, you know, they came in, you know, quickly, and, and it was just more economical on that flat, Point, you know, that flat landscape than it was here. Yes? Were there coyotes or foxes That is a really good question. I'm not, I never have read that, by, but, you know, you do read about a lot of wild animals. Um, you know, I imagine it would have to have been. You know, I've read a lot of stories of bear and, uh, and uh, other wild animals coming after people, so I would certainly think they would be interested in But I didn't run across that many stories about it. But, um, but I used to live right over the fence from a, a dairy farm in Waltham, and they, they had coyotes coming right down the hill and killing calves. They had to get great big furry white dogs from France to guard their, to guard their, I, yeah, they weren't the Pyrenees, but they were nastier than it. They looked like one, but they were a lot meaner. <laughs> so they still, it still happens. So I imagine it did, but I haven't seen stories. Yes, back there? I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. You're, you're running around. Okay. I'm sorry. I think it got to be about 150, as I remember, uh, at the height. And then a lot of them, after the Civil War, some were converted to cotton mills again, um, when cotton came back in. But a lot of that moved out of Vermont as well. Right yes? Uh, what's the deforestation of the land in order to accommodate the sheep farming? Is that mm-hmm. Well, it's interesting because um, the deforestation, a lot was due to sheep, but it wasn't all due to sheep um, because, you know, they were trying to farm, subsistence farmers were going right up to the top of the mountains too. Even with the settlers, the first settlers, I read a story about not the brightest settler, who was talking, they're not all cut out for it. And he was talking about how he had, he was looking for a stake to start his farm, and he went right to the top of the mountain because there weren't many trees up there. You know, didn't kind of make a connection that maybe it wasn't the best place to farm. But, uh, but there you go, you know. So, and so they were cutting them, and, and potash, which you get from burning your, um, your trees when you were clearing your stake, that was sent to England and powered the Industrial Revolution. It was used in a lot of industrial processes in England um, in the 18, you know, late 18th, early 19th century. So that was the way early farmers made some money. And, um, you know, they could bring, you know, so there was, you know, subsistence farmers were also clearing the land. But, um, but as the farms on the top of the hills proved to be not very... Um, productive for cropping, um, they, you know, they worked for sheep. You know, sheep can go anywhere, and um, and that's you know, they, we had a lot of our, you know, we always raised rocks better than anything in Vermont, <laughs> and they had, you know, so we did have a lot of stone walls up in the sheep country, um, which you can still see in the woods nowadays. Are you aware of um, any um, merino sheep in Vermont now? I know that there was a woman on um, Route 7 across from Ropeby, um, which is now a historic site, the Robinson's house, and she had Ron Barn Farm merinos. <coughs> 
Round Barn Molinos. I don't know if she's still there. The Round Barn sadly fell down. But she used to have a flock of merinos and a camel. And uh, <laughs> don't ask me. And, uh, and I haven't seen them there. I don't know that she's still operating, but she's made woolen goods of different sorts of yarns and things from them. So that, those were the only merinos I think I'd seen were her flock. Okay. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about the relationship between sheep farming and stone walls and what they were used for aside from farming rocks? Right, exactly. Well, it was handy that we had them because they're cheaper way to uh, fence in things than, uh, than um, building fences and having to maintain them. You know, once you get it up, you know, uh, the occasional stove might fall out, but, uh, but, they work, but they don't work for everything. And, um, you know, they work well for sheep. You can build one high enough that sheep don't usually get out. But, um, and so, but, you know, they kind of, um, lost the usefulness when dairying took over because cows don't like hills. They really don't like, you know, they'll go up a saber field style little hill, you know, down and coming up from the valley, but they don't like being up on the mountains. And so, um, you know, that land just ceased to be productive and that's why there are so many stone walls. You know, you'll see lilac bushes up there. You know, you'll see places where there were once farmsteads, um, but they just weren't making it. Hi, I, I read once that, and it might have been in your book, I'm not really sure, it was a long time ago, but I read once that when you go in these little villages that you drive around Vermont, sometimes you'll see like a collection of houses in the center of the town and in your book and you wonder, how on earth could these, this set of beautiful houses be here? You showed a couple of you know, grand houses, but is it also true that there was a kind of architectural boom during the 40s and 50s? Absolutely, from sort of 1830, I mean it started in some of the towns, I mean in Middlebury and you know, some of the other towns had you know, beautiful old houses from 1800 onward. But I think the 1830s to 50s were a particularly um, productive architectural period in Vermont. And uh, one thing I said I remember was that when the sheep bust came and you know, the economy was doing badly in the mid, you know, the third quarter of the 19th century was bad economically in Vermont. Um, you know, people had all these beautiful houses that they had built, these, you know, every size of, you know, Greek revival from the one I showed you, the Wilcox Cuts, to just little capes, you know, but they have perfect little trim on the corners, you know, and, and um, unpaid on the lintels and things. And, um, and we were very lucky because poverty is a powerful preservative. A lot of other states had houses, you know, especially in New England, had houses that looked a lot like that. But when they made a little more money, they pulled them all down to put up, you know, the ranch houses of the future, you know. And so, so more of our original housing stock stayed just because when things went bust, you know, no one could put them down. And by the time things got better, they became kind of a, a talking point, you know, people started to appreciate those styles again. But also, they also say that houses that have good floor plans, for instance, are much more apt to survive. So that we probably lost, you know, thousands of houses where, you know, you walk through every room to get into every other bedroom and that kind of thing, you know, that uh, people just thought, oh, forget it. And then, you know, a lot of center hall colonials survived because they are a good floor plan innately, whereas there were other ones that didn't work out. So I don't know how many houses we've lost from that era, but we certainly saved more than a lot of states did. I have a question about uh, laborers. Uh, I, I, I found it fascinating that you mentioned the gender division of labor, but uh, who were the laborers? Was it largely family operation, or were the laborers um, immigrants, were they migrants, um, were they local people? 
And I'm also curious about um, race and labor. I'm curious to know if um, the, the laborers, uh, you know, what you might know about um, you know, African American laborers and indigenous Native American people who are laborers. That's a great question and a huge one. Let's just sit back for the next three hours and we'll talk about that. That's a big one. Um, if you want to talk about laborers, it depends if you're in the country or in the towns. Um, in, the town, in the country, everyone's an agricultural laborer. Some of them are all the, you know, the sons of the, the dads who started the farm who you know, can't get their own land or dad's farm will be cut up too much. That usually goes to a couple of the kids. Um, but you might have eight or ten kids. So you know, there was kind of a floating bunch of agricultural laboring men. And then a lot of, um, of farmers' wives had farm, like hired girls was the thing. So that you know, if you were a woman you know, or a girl, a teenager from one of those farms um, with too many mouths to feed, you could often pick up work in a, you know, a richer farmer's household, helping with all the chores and the cooking and doors. And, um, but a lot of girls also went to work in the mills. The Sheldon Museum in Middlebury has a fascinating run of letters and stories of mill girls who worked at the mill I showed you and other mills around Middlebury. And just talking about their lives, you read their letters home, they, you know, they're they're nice girls. They go to church every Sunday. They write to their moms and say, I did it, you know. And I went. And, um, and uh, you know, they, see, they liked having their own money. I mean, it's nobody, you know, I didn't get the sense looking at them that a lot of them were forced to go do it. There were, you know, girls who were happy to get off the farm and, uh, and be able to have some freedom and some money. And, um, you know, a lot of these agricultural boys who really didn't like farming drifted into towns, too, and found different jobs in the towns as well, just working, working in factories, working for people. And as for race, actually in the early 19th century, they say that, you know, Virgins in like the 1810s had a higher proportion of black people than any town ever in Vermont, possibly the Revenge in Ferrisburg, because there were so many Quaker families there at that time, and they were taking in Underground Railroad people who were fleeing slavery, like the Robinsons at Ropeby. Have a, there's a fantastic exhibit, if you haven't been over there on Route 7 in Ferrisburg, at Ropeby, which is a kind of museum right on the farm. You can go through the farmhouse as well telling the story of this Robinson family taking in all of these, um, all of these um, black people who were making their way, often went to Canada eventually. And it's kind of fascinating because all, it exploded all kinds of myths, like, um, you know, the Underground Railroad there wasn't underground. They were all working out in the fields with the family and, you know, living in the house with the family, and everybody knew they were there because everybody agreed nobody was going to turn them in. Um, uh, though eventually, I'm sure there was racism, eventually, you know, they moved on to bigger places. But, um, but it's kind of interesting. Also, they traced where one of the, the papers of one slave, they traced him back to the place in, was it South Point of the Carolinas, where he had come, and they, you know, the director of rugby at that time, Jane Williamson, was expecting to see something with columns, you know, some big estate. It's this little broken down farm. And they, uh, then they found more letters from his owner, owner, who's, who was writing him letters saying, we played together as kids. We used to go fishing. How can you do this to me? I thought we were friends. He's saying this to his way, like, he doesn't understand why this guy would leave when they were such good friends, you know? I mean, there's a real disconnect, you know, there. Um, and as for, um, you know, indigenous people, a lot of them um, lived in a stationary places in the winter 
making, doing basketry and things, and then traveled through the summer to different places selling native goods that they had made. I mean, that's one way, way they did things. Um, and, uh, and a lot of them were farming as well, but did not, you know, always want their neighbors to know because they took a lot of flack too. So they were, you know, they were sort of hidden in plain sight a lot of the time. I'm curious if you might know that big um, farm in Orwell that you cited in your talk. Might they be related to the Wilcox family that makes all the good ice cream here in Manchester? Oh, that's a great question. I don't know. I don't know. I'll see if I can find out anything about that. I don't know. More power to them. That's all I can say. Whether they are or not, I'll buy it. Uh, I think there was another man who had his hand up over here, maybe, no. Um, any other questions? Yes? I realize that the Marinos aren't uh, noted for their meat, but were the Vermonters eating a lot of lamb? And if they did, did they continue after all those Marino men? Well, you know, um, they did eat lamb. They liked pork better, but they did eat lamb. And they had, you know, their own native breeds that were not regarded as being, you know, the greatest lambs, but they had a little more meat on them than Marinos. So, you know, on a subsistence farm, they might have a couple of sheep for spinning wool at home and um, for eating as well, but they didn't. You know, there were some bigger flocks of native sheep, but uh, I don't know if every farm had them, you know, but uh, they were around. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you all.